All right, so Genesis chapter 39. Last week, we kind of had a pause in the Joseph story with, with, the, with um, that whole story about Judah. Now we're back into the life of Joseph. You remember his, his brothers had thrown him into that pit, and then the, they saw the Ishmaelites coming, and they sold him as a slave under the Ishmaelites. So here we're picking up in Genesis 39, and this man Potiphar, he was an Egyptian, and he had bought Joseph from the Ishmaelites to be his servant, to be his slave. And, um, of course, he brings him home. And just to give you just a rough overview of this entire chapter before we get into it, he buys Joseph and, you know, sets him over the things of his household. And Joseph's running his house, and he sees that he's a, first of all, he's a good worker. And everything that he's doing, you know, God's blessing. So Joseph is just on top of all this work, and it gets to the point where he basically has Joseph running everything. He's like running the whole house, running the whole business, doing it, doing it all. He's like his number one main guy. Obviously, this guy's buying slaves. He's wealthy. You know, he's, he's buying someone to take care of his business for him, take care of his, what's what it says, his house. It doesn't mean like he's like vacuuming and doing that type of thing. He's running, you know, essentially his, you know, probably his livestock and his, you know, his farm or what, you know, whatever, whatever it is that, that's in his house, that's his business that he's operating Joseph is kind of in charge of all of that stuff. And God's blessing him for his hard work. But then we see um, Potiphar's wife you know, takes a liking to him and is trying to get him to commit adultery. And Joseph runs away, says no. And she basically makes up this story that he was trying to force her. You know, and, then Joseph, and then the master of the house, you know, she lies about him and gets him thrown into prison. That's the overview of the story. But we're going to dig into this because there's a, there's a lot of great things that we could learn in this story. And the first thing I want to point out here, we'll start reading in verse number one. It says, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh. See, he's an officer of Pharaoh. He's basically, you know, working directly for Pharaoh. So he's kind of got a pretty good position, you know, in, in the government. And he's got this nice government job, probably making a, a pretty decent uh, um, income, as I mentioned earlier. Probably a rich man hiring a slave to take care of his things. And he's an officer of Pharaoh. It says, captain of the guard, an Egyptian. Bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. Look at verse 2. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. And that the Lord, <clears throat> and that the Lord made all that He did to prosper in His hand. Now we see this word prosperous, prosper, and at the very end of the chapter we talk, we see again God making him to prosper. And I want to go a little bit into that here. Excuse me, because it's mentioned three times that, that God is prospering Joseph. Now we have a false gospel out there today. It's called the prosperity gospel, and there's these are the things that like the, the Joel Osteens and these guys will preach. And there's a, there's a lot of people out there. I, I don't know why it, it gains so much attention. You, you'd think you'd be able to spot these snake oil salesmen a mile away. And they, they teach you that, you know, God wants you to be rich. They'll teach you that, that God wants you to have all this wealth. And that basically it's a sign of your spirituality, the more wealth you have. So you see like Joel Osteen, you know, he's this multi-millionaire. He's got this huge mansion. He lives in this place. And, and he would think, hey, this is a sign of just how godly I am because God's just pouring out these blessings on me. That must mean God's really happy and because I'm so prosperous. But that's a lie. That's a false gospel. There are many godly people that have nothing, that are, that are poor, dirt poor, that have none of the riches of this world, yet they are very godly indeed. And God is blessing them and they are prospering. Now, when you look at the word prosper, it doesn't necessarily mean you have a bunch of, a bunch of, fi bunch of finances. Joseph, in this, in this situation, Joseph is still a slave. Don't forget that. As much as God is prospering him, he is still a slave. He belongs physically to somebody else. He's property. So, yes, the work that he's doing, he's doing a lot, making a lot of increase for his master. He's bringing a lot to his boss. But it doesn't mean that he's just this rich man and that he has all of this luxury. Now, we don't know here how much you know, his, his, uh, his master is, is actually doing for him or giving him. But when it comes down to the end of the day, I mean, he's a slave. He belongs to somebody. 
He may be being treated well, but none of that is, is his, he's, he's, he has no ownership over this stuff because he's not free. So, and, and all throughout the Bible, I, I did a word study just on the word, all forms of the word prosper. And more often than not, it's not talking about you know, physical wealth. It's just prospering in what you do. Oftentimes in, you know, in the book of Kings and Chronicles, it's talking about a war and you know, he's prospering at war. It means you're doing well. It means you're getting the upper hand. It means that whatever is going on in the battles, that you're succeeding, that you're, show, you're getting great success. It doesn't mean that you're amassing a bunch of wealth. You're just prospering in whatever that you do. And um, turn, if you would, to Joshua chapter 1. We're going we're to look at a few mentions that I, that I was talking about when I was looking up these words prosper in the Bible. In Deuteronomy 29.9, sit down. The Bible reads, Keep therefore the words of this covenant and do them that ye may prosper in all that ye do. And the first thing I want to point out is that We've, I've mentioned this before. Joseph uh, had already seemed to be this godly man. We see that he's, a, he's an image. He's a picture, a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of similarities that you'll find in these stories that are, that are written down in the, books of, in the book of Genesis about Joseph. And you can see the foreshadowing of Jesus Christ to come. We see that Joseph seemed to be a godly man. He seemed to be, um, you know, he was getting these visions earlier. But he was also a hard worker, even though he had a bad situation, even though he was a slave, he could look at us and be like, hey, I was born free. I shouldn't be a slave. And he gave this poor attitude. He took whatever, God, you know, whatever hand he was given in life and he went with it. And he said, well, you, know, you wake up one day, he's, you know, his, his brothers had thrown him in a ditch. They sold him into slavery. Hey, that's not fair. He could, he could wake up every day and complain about that and have a bad attitude and go through life complaining about the fact that he was sold into slavery. And that, you know, wouldn't that seem like a pretty legitimate thing to be upset about and to complain about and say, hey, I'm a slave. You know, my brothers did this to me. I was born free. You can have sympathy for somebody like that. But what we see Joseph doing, he's saying, well, here I am. It's not right. And we know it. No one's saying that it's right. What happened to him? It's, it's, a, it's a horrible thing, but he's moving forward. He's not going to let that get him down. He's saying, well, as long as I'm here, I'm just going to serve like I'm serving the Lord. I'm going to serve God. And we'll get into a little bit about being a hard worker. We see how much Joseph is being a hard worker and how much he has respect for God's word. The Bible says, I'll read it for you again in Deuteronomy 29.9. Keep therefore the words of this covenant and do them. Talking about the Old Testament, God's law. If you keep God's law and do them, he says that ye may prosper in all that you do. If you're doing right by God, hey, God will bless you. God's going to make you to prosper in what you're doing. Does that mean that he's just going to give you tons of riches? No. The Bible says, you know, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. So what you're doing, if you're doing what God wants you to do, you're going to be serving God. You're going to be doing his work. And guess what? He's going to cause you to prosper at his work. He's going to cause you to be successful at reaching people and helping other people out and giving the gospel and getting people saved and doing all these other things. And along the way, you know what? He says, you know, you seek, seek me first. Seek first the kingdom of heaven. All these things shall be added unto you. He'll take care of all the rest. He'll make sure that you also prosper in, in the little things. It doesn't mean you're going to be extremely wealthy, but yeah, he's going to cause you to prosper in all that you do. So if I'm working my hardest to, to serve God and I also have a job on the side, you know, God's going to make me prosper at that job also so that I could continue to do what I'm doing. So I could support my family and continue to serve Him. And that's the way that God works. And we see here that Joseph is obviously following God's commandments. And we see that later as he, as he refuses to commit adultery. He said, I'm not going to sin against God. He's working as if he's working for the Lord. And he's keeping his commandments and God is causing him to prosper. It's not a mistake. It's not a coincidence. The Bible tells us right, you know, right there in Deuteronomy. But you're, if you're in Joshua 1, we're going to see another example here. Joshua 1, verse number 7. The Bible reads, Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Again, the same exact thing he's saying. 
If you are doing all that Moses commanded, if you're following God's law, he said, keep the law. Don't turn to the right hand or to the left from following God's law. Stay right on the path. And God will cause you to, po to prosper anywhere you go. Wherever you're going, if you're on God's path, wherever he leads you, he'll cause you to prosper. Hey, Joseph was on God's path. You may think, how in the world is Joseph on God's path? He was sold into slavery. He was on God's path. And we see that later on. All these bad things that happened to him. First he's sold into slavery. Now he's got Potiphar's wife lying about him, about him committing adultery, wanting to commit adultery with him. He's thrown into prison. You might say, that's even worse. A lot of people take that situation and say, hey, I'm trying to follow God. I'm trying to do what's right. And all these bad things keep happening to me. Why should I even bother anymore? God's not prospering me. That's a wrong attitude. Because Joseph did not make it at this point to where God was leading him. We, we know the end of the story. Those of us have read our Bibles more than once. That if you're, if, you're, if you're coming here and you're just up to Genesis 39, just sticking with us every week, you know, try to get ahead. But um, I don't think that's the case for anyone here. We know that Joseph ends up in Egypt, which is he's in Egypt, but he ends up working for Pharaoh and basically becomes number two under Pharaoh. After all these bad things happen, he's in prison, everything, you know, all this, this horrible events happen to him. Ultimately, he ends up in charge. He ends up saving the people by storing up food for the famine that's going to come. God had him in place for a purpose. God made all, allowed all these bad things to happen in his life so that he can be used for a much greater event later on. But see, at this point in his life, he doesn't see that. He doesn't know that. And when we come to a point like this in our life, don't give up. Don't let that get you out and be like, well, forget it. This is too hard. I'm trying to do what's right, and it just seems like nothing's working out for me. That's the wrong attitude to have. Joseph had the right attitude all the way through this, and God blessed him for it. We see even at the end of the chapter, you know, even in prison, God's prospering him, and what happens? Well, he's basically running the prison, right? I mean, he's, he's number two in command in the prison. Everywhere he goes, he's prospered to the point to where he's just elevated in his status and in his position because God is with him and God is blessing him. And it's because Joseph is keeping his integrity and Joseph is doing what's right in the sight of the Lord. And God is ordering his footsteps, whether they seem pleasant or not. And we need to keep that in focus. We need to keep that in mind. Sometimes you might not understand why are we struggling so hard for it? Why are we in a situation? I don't, you know, I'm losing my job. I have to move out. I'm getting evicted. You know, whatever the case may be, things are going on. Why is all this happening? Don't blame God foolishly, first of all. He may have a very specific reason why you're going through that. It may not be a result of your sin. He may be leading you somewhere. We just need to have faith and say, well, I'm just going to keep on doing what's right. I'm not going to swerve to the left hand or to the right. I'm going to make sure I stay on this path. And if, you know, if this is a path that God has me going down, if it's, if it's a path of, of being extremely poor, if it's a path of, of not having very good health, if it's a path of, you know, God forbid, you know, losing a limb, losing my eyesight, or, or you know, something like that to happen, hey, I'm going to just trust that whatever is happening, there is going to be a greater purpose for this event. I'm going to keep reading. I don't think I even read verse 8 in Joshua 1. Verse 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So now we see those words again, being prosperous, having success is tied in with keeping the law, with keeping God's commandments. Now, that's the last thing you're going to hear Joel Osteen preach on is anything out of God's law. You're not going to hear because that's sin, right? Breaking the law is sin. When you preach hard on sin, you don't hear these guys talking about it. They're talking about making money. But in order to truly be prosperous, in order to have success, we need to be meditating in the law. Now think about that. Do you do that? Let's read verse 8 again, Joshua 1, 8. It's a great verse to memorize, verses 7 and 8. 
Memorize these verses. Keep it with you. The, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. This ought to be something that you're talking about. This is something that should be coming out of your lips. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night. This is, you know what? This, this will even hit home to me. Day and night. Not just at night, not just before you go to bed. Day and night. This should be a meditation. This should be something that you're thinking about. Reading, yes, and thinking about God's Word day and night. Amen. And if you do that, he says that thou mayest observe, the reason why you meditate in God's law is that you may observe to do according to all that's written therein. If you're thinking about God's law, if you're meditating on it and thinking about it, that's how you're going to keep it. That's how you're going to be doing what's right because you're thinking about it. It's when you're completely ignoring it and not thinking about God's law at all is when you end up catching yourself you know, backsliding or getting into sin and doing things that you shouldn't be doing at all because you're not even thinking about it. It can be so easy sometimes to get into sin when God's Word, the Bible, God's law is just not even in your brain at all. You're around a bunch of other people. Hey, everyone else is doing this thing. You're not thinking about God's word at all. The next thing you know, you're doing it. It's easy. It happens like that. But if you're meditating in God's word, you're going to be keeping his way. You're going to be doing, observing to do according to all that is written there. And he says, if you can do that, then shall he, then shall, uh, he make thy way prosperous. And then thou shalt have good success. You want to be very successful at serving the Lord. You feel like, you know, I, I, my heart's willing. I want to do what's right, but I'm just not seeing very good success. I, I just, I don't feel like, like God's really using me. I don't feel like I'm being very successful in what I'm doing. Here's your answer right here. Make it a meditation. This is why we do the, the Bible memory passage. And this is why the, you know, I, I keep on, um, stressing to stay with it and keep it a regular part of your day. I know it's hard. Look, I have, I have a difficult, I'll be honest with you, I have difficulty with it too. I do. But we need to, if we want to be successful, this is what we got to do. And, and stay with it. And when you're memorizing, you are meditating on those words. You're thinking about them. You're repeating them. And you're, and you're, what you're doing is you're imprinting them on your heart. And when you have them, in your mind and in your heart, you'll, you'll be doing them. I mean, you'll, you'll at least be thinking about them so that when any situations come up, you're going to be like, wait a minute, I was, just, I was just memorizing this. I was just thinking about that. I'm going to run away from that. I'm not going to get involved in that anywhere close to that. Or what, you know, whatever the situation may be. But when you have God's, and, and then God will cause you to be prosperous. God will give you real success. And think about that success. Prosperous. Again, we're not talking about physical riches. Like I said, Joseph was a slave. But how many rewards do you think Joseph has laid up for him in heaven? You think about Joseph's life. Probably quite a few. Out of all the work that he was doing, out of all these bad times and everything he was doing and still keeping his head up and still doing what's right and not laying him down and just, and just working for God and being, being mindful of what God has commanded him. And, all this, and you know what? Look at this, the very situation that Joseph's in. He could, let, he could have let his position get to his head, right? Even though he's a slave, I mean, he's running everything. He's an important guy. In this Potiphar's house, he's a very important guy. People are looking up to him. People probably have a lot of respect for him because, hey, everything he's doing is prospering. This guy knows what he's talking about. There's probably a bunch of other servants that are looking up to him and, and taking orders from him. And the, very, and the only thing that was withheld from him is Potiphar's wife. He could have let all of that get to him and get into this sinful lust of his flesh and just be like, hey, I'm the one running the show. I deserve even Potiphar's wife. But that's not what Joseph did. No. Joseph was a godly man. He says, uh-uh. And look at this. I wasn't going to get this to later, but let's look at that. In, um, Because this is an important point. I don't want to forget this. Starting in verse number 7, it says, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house. He's saying, 
Potiphar doesn't even know everything that I'm over because he's given me everything to take care of that he doesn't even know all of the things that I'm taking care of because he's just basically put me over everything. My master was not what is with me in the house and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee because thou art his wife. And it's this, he has this feeling of gratitude saying, look, he's given me everything. He's putting me in, the, me in this position to, to be ruler over the whole household. The only thing that he hasn't given me is you, but I mean, you're his wife. Of course he's not going to give me you. But look at what he says here. Because you could say, well, the reason why Joseph did it is because he had respect for Potiphar. No. I don't believe that. Because some people might be in this position and be like, oh, well, Potiphar is a real jerk. He's not paying attention to his wife. He's off doing these other things. Maybe Potiphar has, has a mistress or something. And you can say, see, well, he's, he's being in, you know, has infidelity going on in his marriage. So why not? I mean, you know, why not? Why would it be wrong for me then to take part in this? Because it's his wife. Regardless of what Potiphar is doing, regardless of whether or not you have respect for him, what's right is that you don't commit adultery because she's already married and belongs to somebody else. And this is the exact attitude he has. Look what he says. Because thou art his wife, the end of verse 9, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Is he worried about Potiphar? No, he's worried about God. He's worried about doing what's right in God's eyes. He's saying, look, it's one thing you know, to, to, to be seen well in the sight of man, but he's saying, I'm working, he's working and doing his job as if he's working for God. He's saying, I can't sin like this against God. Committing adultery is a big deal. You may not think, you Egyptians might not think it is. But this is a big deal. Joseph maintained that trade, and he worked as if he worked for the Lord. And that's the way that a Christian ought, the way that a Christian ought to work. Turn if you would to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter number 6. In Genesis 39, just in verse 6, right before we were reading about Potiphar's wife, it says, And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well-favored. Oh, excuse me, in verse 5 was the one I wanted to read. And it came to pass from that time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And um, because of his hard work, we see here that everything that, that Potiphar had was in Joseph's hand. Everything. I mean, he didn't even know. He said, he, said, um, he knew not aught that he had in verse 6. He, knew, he didn't know anything even that he had in his own house except for the bread that he was eating. That's how much trust and faith he had in Joseph to do his job. And he says, you know what? I don't even know what's going on because I trust that whatever you're doing is the right thing. And that's how faithful of a man Joseph was and how much, how much trust that Potiphar had in him. And he's just, you know, he's eating every day. He's eating well. He's like, okay, well, things must be going well. That's all he knows is what he's eating. And it says, and Joseph was a goodly person, well favored. You're in Ephesians 6. Look at verse number 5. Because Joseph is a great example of how a Christian ought to work. The faithfulness and the trust that you ought to have as a Christian. You, your boss ought to be able to put you in a position just like Joseph was put in, where he doesn't have to worry about a thing. He can put, you can give you the company vehicle and give you the credit card and tell you to go off and run these errands. He can tell you, hey, I want this job done next week and not even have to ask you about it again because he just knows that you're going to get that job done. He could give you the opportunities to, to never have to watch over what you're doing because he knows, hey, this is a faithful man. This is the way a Christian ought to work. And it ruins your testimony when you're the type of person that just works with, as, as, a, as a men pleaser. Where you only are working hard when the boss shows up behind you. And you're like, oh, quick, put everything, you know, like whatever it is you're screwing around with, put that away and make it look busy. Right? You're supposed to, you're supposed to be digging a ditch and you're, you're standing there and all of a sudden, oh, the boss is pulling up. Wait, 
Ugh. Let me do this real fast and try to work up a little bit of a sweat. That is a very poor, poor example, and that's going to ruin your test. No one's going to take you seriously when that's the type of work you are, where you're only doing things for show when the boss shows, shows up. Those are the same types of people that they come to church and they put on their fancy clothes. They put on their suits and their dresses and they use all the right language. They got their Bible in their case right with them. Hey, brother, good morning. How you doing? Great to see you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Everything's just great. And then they go home and what do they do? You know, they're going, they're turning on their TV, they're smoking this, they're, they're doing all this stuff, and they're living a worldly lifestyle. But hey, when they're in church, you know, they put on that show, they put on their face as a hypocrite that they're just so godly. It's the same thing with the worker that, that only is doing anything when the boss is looking over their shoulder and they, they're not being faithful. It ruins your testimony. No one's going to take you seriously. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 5. Bible says, servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. Now look, let's apply this today. You say, oh, well, you know, I'm not a slave. Say, look, it says servants, first of all. If you have a boss at your company, he employs you, you're serving him. Amen. He is your master, okay? Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. You say, yeah, but he's an idiot. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Servants. Be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling. But I know more than him. Look, it doesn't change what God's word says. It doesn't matter. You may think you know more than him, and maybe you don't. Maybe you're just arrogant and proud and stubborn and you just think that you know everything. Or maybe you do know more than him. It doesn't matter. That's not the point. If you're working for them, you do what they say. Or else you go off and start your own business. And then you can be your own boss. Go ahead and do it. But while you're working for someone else, you ought to be a servant that, that serves with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Paul says, look, if you're going to be working for somebody, do it as if you're working for Jesus Christ. And this is something that's helped me out a little bit in my life. I start thinking, you know, if I start slacking off or screwing up on the job, which happens every once in a while, I start thinking like, man, you know, I'm working for Jesus. Jesus is watching every, all the time. He knows what you're doing. You know, you may be able to get by behind the boss's back with some things because he's never going to know. But if you're working as unto Christ, he always knows what's going on. And you ought, you ought to want to please him anyways. Regardless of the fact that he sees when you're screwing up, you should be like, no, I want, I want to give my all. I want to give my best unto Jesus. You ought to give your all unto your boss, unto your master at work. That's the way that a Christian ought to work. Let's keep reading with verse number six. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. So don't worry about your boss if he's an idiot because that's not who you're ultimately serving anyways. You're ultimately serving the Lord. That's who you need to have in your heart as who you're serving. So whether you're flipping burgers, whether you're spinning a sign, well, we saw this guy on the road, you know how they have the, the sign spinners now that are standing out in the corners. I'll tell you what, I, I pointed at a guy, I was like, you know what? That guy, and, and I don't know what, they probably pay these guys minimum wage, you know, it's, it's, it, it's not a whole lot of skill involved, but this guy had skill what he's doing. I said, you know what? That guy is, is, is doing his job very well. No, it didn't make me go in and buy anything that they had, but <laughs> the guy's out. I mean, he's spinning it around. He's got it going on his back, and he's flipping it up in the air, and he's, you know. So you know what? That's what they're paying that guy. Good for that guy. And you know what? That guy's probably not going to be spinning sides for very long because he's going to be blessed for doing that type of a work and putting his heart into it and working as if it matters and not just sitting there with a chair and umbrella and just, you know, doing one of these as some of those guys do. But that guy, I mean, you put your effort into it, you're going to get blessed for doing that. That's the way it works. And God's going to see that. And, and you know, in your heart, you ought to be serving. Now, obviously, I don't know that guy's heart. I don't know if he was doing that to, to serve the Lord or not. But that's the way that a Christian ought to be working. If your job is a sign spinner, hey, do the best that you possibly can as if you're doing that for Jesus. As if you're holding up a sign saying, hey, Jesus saves, come this way. How bad would you try to get people's attention if you're holding up a sign and that was your job given to you by God that says, hey, I want you to get people's attention and bring them into church or bring them this way that you can give them the gospel and do whatever it is that you need to do in order to get their attention to bring them in. If Jesus gave you that job, how would you do that job? 
That's the way you need to look at, at the secular job, whatever it is that you're doing. We need to keep that focus and keep that in mind. And when we leave tonight, don't just, don't just throw that on the shelf somewhere and forget it and then go back to work tomorrow and start screwing up because the boss isn't around. Look, let it sink in. Ephesians chapter 6, again, another, another great chapter, a great passage here to learn. If you have a problem with it, if you struggle with not working well, then learn these, learn these verses. It says in verse 7, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. He's saying, look, whether, whether you're a slave or not, whether, whether you're a servant or whether you're free. If you're doing these good things, God's going to bless you for that. You say, oh, well, my boss, it doesn't seem to matter how hard I work, he doesn't give me a raise. Look, God sees that hard work that you're doing. And God will make sure that it comes back to you, one way or another. He'll make sure that, that, that things are right. If you're serving in your heart to God, God doesn't let anything go unpaid. God doesn't let your good deeds just go unnoticed. Your boss may let things go unnoticed. I know what it's like to work for a boss where all the things they're doing seem to go by unnoticed. Where you, you don't seem to be getting your true value that you're bringing in, that, that, you're, that you're putting forth. I get it. But don't let that spoil and bitter your heart. Because ultimately you shouldn't be working just for your boss. You should be working for Christ. And if you know that, you know, hey, I'm just going to do my best because even if he doesn't pay me well, even if he's not doing what I'm supposed to be doing, God will make sure that things work out um, in our favor. Now, I wanted to make a quick point here. Uh, I got a little bit ahead of myself, and that's fine. It, it made sense with the way things were going. But about the whole Joseph prospering, because of course he's prospering because he's working for God. He's doing what's right. And you have these, these people out there. I want you to turn, if you would, to Psalm uh, 73. Psalm 73. I want you to see this. Because God does want us to prosper. We've already seen, you know, prospering doesn't necessarily have to do with wealth. Uh, the, the memory verse that we're learning in the book of 3 John, verse number 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. So we see here, even John is saying, look, unto Gaius, I, you know, I want you to prosper. I want your soul to prosper, even as your soul prospereth. I want you to prosper and be in health. I want you to do well. These are the verses that the prosperity gospel will take and rip out of context and just say, see, God wants you to be rich. When it doesn't say be rich with the, with the world's riches, it just says prosper. Psalm 73, 12 gives us a perfect contrast between the Lord prospering you with what you're doing and the prosperity of the world. The false, the false preachers preach the prosperity of the world, which is riches, which is mammon. I mean, the Bible says that you cannot serve God and mammon. It's one or the other. You're either serving God or you're serving money. You're serving riches. You're not, you're not doing both. Psalm 73, look at verse number 12. Verse number 12, Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. So you're talking about worldly prospering. The ungodly, they increase in riches. It's the ungodly that, that are worried about prospering in the world and increasing in their riches. So when you see, this is like, I think, the, I don't want to say it for a fact because I, I, I can't say it 100% without a doubt, but I think this is the only verse where prosper or prosperity is used with riches in the same verse. And it's, and it's obviously not a positive con connotation. It's talking about the world does this. The ungodly are prospering in their riches. But the godly man prospers because the Lord is, is helping them to do well in whatever they're doing, not because he's just giving them the riches of this world. <clears throat> Let's move on from there. In... Uh, Turn if you were to Titus chapter 2. Let's see where we're at. Oh, we're doing okay with time. 
We're going to see one more passage here on, on how, a, how a Christian man ought to work. I know I'm jumping around a little bit, but it's okay. I, think, I don't think, the, the subject matter isn't that difficult that it's, uh, that it's hard to stay with it. Titus, you, we, just, we need to get this stuff down though. We need, we need this ingrained into our hearts, into our souls, that, that, that this is who we are, that we are this type of a person, that we are so faithful you could be trusted with anything. And that's why I thank God that, that you know, with Brother Sebastian, being someone that I can trust when, when situations arise and I'm not even able to be here in church, I know everything's going just fine. I know everything is going well because I have someone that I've seen doing the work that I could trust. I don't even have to, to, to worry about a thing because I know that, that he's going to be here to take care of things. And you need, you know, we need to make sure that we're that type of person for someone else. If, if you, in any situation, you have somebody over you where you're, where you're you know, um, you, you have a boss or whatever the situation may be. Um, that you can be dependable and faithful like that. Look at verse number 6 of Titus chapter 2. Titus 2 verse 6, Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. And, you know, this is like Joseph. Everything he was doing was great. They had to lie about him in order to bring up an evil report. They had to lie about the adultery thing, right? Everything else that he was doing was great. You know, it's, and this is a pattern that we need to have of ourselves. You know, it says the young men, we need to exhort the young men to, to show themselves to be a pattern of these things, of good works. A pattern. It means you're doing it over and over again. It means someone else can look at what you're doing and say, hey, I'm going to follow that pattern, that example. I'm going to be doing what he's doing because what he's doing is a lot of good works. His doctrine is not corrupted. He's not believing in all these, these, um, you know, these, these men who are lying and wait to deceive. He's not believing in all these weird, false doctrines and getting caught up in a, in a bunch of nonsense. He, he has gravity. He takes things serious. He's sincere about his faith to the Lord. He's not just, he's not just a hypocrite and, and saying one thing and doing another. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. The, the words that you're saying, it's not, it's not like you're just saying a bunch of false things. Hey, the things that you're saying is right on. It says that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed of having no evil thing to save you. We need to make sure that we have that pattern. That when others look at us, it's, it's a continuous thing that, that we, we are fitting this mold. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Again, this is, this is showing that it's way more important to just be obedient on the job. Don't, don't be answering again and being like, well, that's a stupid thing. I think we should be doing this. You know, and, and mouthing off to your boss and just telling them that always that, that things should be done this way or that way. Now, look, I have a boss that, that allows, you know, feedback and he wants to know because there's a, there's a value that you bring when you go over things and you talk about, you know, the best way to, to do things. That's not what this verse is talking about. This is talking about just, just answering back and just kind of talking back to your boss when he tells you to do something. So the difference between discussing What's the best way to do this? And I need you to do this. The boss says, I need you to do this. You say, okay. When do you want it done? That's it. I mean, that's what, that's what we're supposed to be doing. We need to have that level of respect. And, you know, this, this should go through in all areas of our life, you know, whether it's at, at, on the job, wherever your position is. This is kind of what Brother Corbett was getting in on Sunday night in his sermon that he preached, you know, about the man of God. People these days seem to have zero respect for, for the pastor or an elder at a church that's like, you know, because, and part of the reason is because you have a bunch of people who they're not doing the work, they're ignorant of the scripture, and they're the blind leading the blind, and you see that, and of course you don't have respect for people like that. But look, God has, has given, you know, for someone who's, who really is a man of God, not just, just a hypocrite or a, or a false prophet, but for someone who is a man of God, that is, that is a position that deserves respect. That is something that, that people ought to, to treat the person with honor or with respect. 
as is a father in a household, as is a husband in a marriage. These are positions, you know, all, all through life, as is a boss at the workplace. That deserves respect. And you are to be under obedience depending on what position you're in. If you're the wife, you're to be in obedience. If you're a child, you're to be obedience. If you're the, the servant, you're to be obedience. And we're all in obedience to Christ. We ought not to have this stubborn, rebellious attitude, though, of, of answering back and, and uh, you know, answering again, as the Bible says here. But let's go back to, uh, to Genesis 39. Actually, turn, if you would, to Proverbs 6, because the next thing I want to hit on is Potiphar's wife now. And something that's extremely important, especially for the men to learn from this story. In Genesis 39, Joseph was a righteous man. We're turning to Proverbs 6. Joseph was a righteous man. Joseph was doing what was right. We can see that his, his, his heart was in the right place. He was doing a good job. He was serving. He was faithful. He was doing all the things that he was supposed to be doing. And what happened? This adulteress tries to entice him. And he stays strong. He refuses. He says, no, I'm not going to do it. So Joseph is an example of someone who's doing what's right. Is he not? I mean, it, he's doing the things he's supposed to be doing. But we need to, be, as men, you need to be aware of this. Because I, I brought this up earlier. I hinted at this. You know, you could be in this position. And people, too often times, will let this get to their heads. Of thinking that, you know, they're on top of the world. Hey, I'm this, I'm this hot shot. I'm, this, I'm the guy in charge. I'm the boss. I'm the man and start thinking they're entitled to sinning, then they're, they're not. I mean, you're never entitled to sin, ever. But you start getting this, this, this full of yourself type of an attitude, and when you start getting focused on yourself, which is possible to do, especially when things are going your way and everything that you touch seems to turn to gold, instead of recognizing being humble and saying, wow, God's really working through me and, and, and helping me be prosperous, you start thinking, well, I'm doing this because I'm so smart and I'm so great. And you start to get this puffed up attitude. And then you'll start thinking like, well, I'm going to take me this woman. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to take that woman. And that's one of the reasons I believe personally that God never even wanted a king to be in power because it's too much power. It's too much prestige for one man to have. I mean, we saw with David and with Solomon, the, the downfall that they had in taking wives and they started giving in to these lusts of their flesh. I mean, David committed adultery with another man's wife. And I believe part of the reason for that is because of the position that they get into where they start thinking too highly of even themselves. Because no man should be in that type of position of authority and power. That was not God's design. He's given us his law and judges that is the way that he wanted the, the government to, to be established and not to have all power held in one man with one because we're because we're flesh, because we have the sinful nature to do what's wrong. When we're put in these positions, it's it's it often becomes just too tempting to resist. And um but we, we see that happen. But look at, this is what we always, in regardless of the position that you're in, see, when you're at the top, there's also a draw for a man that's in charge for women to want to, to be with a man who's, who's commanding and has, respect, you know, and has respect of a lot of people and has these positions. There's a lot more women that are going to try um, to, to you know, get with a person like that. And it says in Proverbs 6, verse 23, Look at Proverbs 6, 23. The Bible reads, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Again, we, we need to be focused on God's commandments. Let's re keep reading here, verse 24. Why? Why do we need to, um, you know, are the, the reproofs of God and instructions are the way of life? To keep thee from the evil woman. Sarah, go back, my mother. To keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. So this is describing this evil woman who is using the flattery of her tongue, praising you. Oh, you're so great, you're so wonderful, and starting to say, you know, maybe some of the things you might not be hearing from your wife, which you ought to be hearing from your wife, but 
you know, maybe you all, even if you are hearing from your wife, we got to watch out for the first of all these women that are just laying on flattery. We're not talking about a compliment here or there when you just do something really good and someone says, hey, nice job on that deal or nice job doing this or that. That's normal. The flattery comes when it's, you know, someone starts lifting you up on a pedestal. Oh, you are just, you are just incredible. You are so good. How do you do this? And just people lift you up and, and watch out, men, for the woman that starts doing this. For the strange woman, it says, the tongue of a strange woman. A strange means it's not your wife, that's somebody else. Whether she's married or not, I mean, it's just coming from a strange woman. Watch out. Lust not after her beauty. Maybe she's really beautiful and attractive. Don't lust after her beauty in your heart. Don't let that happen. He says, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. Right? Her, the, the outward appearance, that, that physical beauty that uh, this, this adulteress might have, don't, don't get caught in that trap. Because that's all it is, is a trap. It's like, it's like putting you know, honey out there on a, on a big bear claw. Don't get sucked in by the honey. Like, oh, wow, that's so sweet and good. I just want a little taste of that. And then, boom, the trap springs. The beauty of a strange woman is exactly like that. Oh wow! This you know, this woman's so beautiful, and she's so interested in me. Oh man, it's a trap. Verse twenty-six: For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread. She will destroy you, bring you to nothing. You think that you're doing so well. Joseph could have been thinking, "Man, I'm doing so great. I'm on top of the world." Potiphar's wife could bring him to nothing, which she ended up doing anyways, but it wasn't his fault. It says, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. There are women out there that are adulteresses, that they're, hunt, they're on the hunt. They're looking for the good God. They look at it as a game, as they're hunting. The, the, you know, and Christian man, watch out for this. Take serious heed to this. This isn't the Bible. I'm not just coming up with this on my own. There are women out there that are going to see you that has integrity. You have merit. You love your wife. You have this great thing established. And maybe you start doing well and you're, you know, and you're bringing more attention to yourself for some reason because people are respecting you because God's prospering your way and, and you're doing things that are good and these adulteresses are going to come and they're going to try to hunt for you and they're going to try to get you to commit sin and commit adultery with them. Because it's a challenge, because they're thinking, oh yeah, you know, I'm so beautiful, I could have just about any man anyways, but this guy who has this integrity that claims that he loves his wife, I'm going to work extra hard at him. Because he says it's never going to happen, I'll, I'll make sure that happens. And this is, this, they hunt for the precious life. It's out there. You might think, oh, no one's like that. Yes, there are people like that. Yes, there are. And you as a man need to be, don't just, you know, and look, when it's not happening, don't just be like, oh, blow it off. Oh, yeah, she's just, she's just being nice or something. Look, stay away from that person. You start to recognize that? I don't care. I don't care if that offends them. I don't care if they, if they think you're a jerk and, they, you know, and, and people all start talking about you, how rude or how mean you are or something like that. I don't care. If you're married and some woman starts talking about you like that or talking to you like that and starts really just laying it on thick and you start to sense, hey, I think this, this, this woman is an adulteress and she's trying to flatter me, be abrupt. Be short. Stay away from her. Because you don't want to let yourself get close. Here's why. Look at verse number 27. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not get burned? Don't even get close. That's a fire. You take that fire, just, just an embrace. You're going to get burned, buddy. Verse 28, Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her, shall not be innocent. That will destroy you. I, th I, I personally think that adultery is worse than murder. I think adultery is probably like Apart from some weird reprobate type of a sin, I think adultery is like the worst thing that you can do. The worst thing. The amount of trust and faith that your spouse puts in you, 
to go off and cheat on them and, and, and the, the amount of pain and anguish that you put your spouse through just because of your own lust and your own flesh and your own lack of self-control and your own lack of love for your wife and for your family. That's hurtful. That's a worse pain, I think. I mean, I've never had to go through it, thank God, and I pray that, that I never have to, but I think it would be a worse pain than even losing your spouse in like a car wreck and them dying an untimely death to have them turn on you and be unfaithful to you. I mean, God ordained a death penalty for adulterers for a reason because it's a, it's a wicked, heinous crime that you shouldn't be doing. And we need to watch out from that because people do it. People, the adulteress is out to hunt for the precious life. You need to be aware of that. Joseph was aware of it. But here's the mistake that Joseph made. Let's keep reading. Let's go back to Genesis 39 in verse number 10. And this is one of the things that I want you to take away from this chapter that we need to learn. First of all, get it in your head that there are women out there that are hunting for the precious life. You might think, and, and you know, and I've thought this before. Like, I, no woman's interested. You know, why would a woman be interested in me? You don't even have to worry about that. You don't have to understand why. You may think there is no good reason why. You know, I have this lowly job, right? You know, it doesn't matter if, if they just see that. If they just know that you're a Christian and you say, "I'm," ne you know, it's till death do us part. I am committed unto my wife. That could be enough. That could be enough of a challenge for the adulteress. That's all it takes. You say, "Well, I'm not in charge of everything, and people aren't all looking up to me." Doesn't matter. Don't, don't let that let your guard down. Let's read here in Genesis 39, verse 10. And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day that he hearkened not unto her. Look, she's coming over and over again to him. She's, she's just trying to wear him down. This is a continual thing that's happening. Day by day, she's just, just whispering in his ear. And he's not listening to her. He's not hearkening unto her to lie by her or to be with her. Verse 11, and it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business. So Joseph's doing his job. He's doing what he's supposed to be doing. It says, and there was none of the men of the house there within. This is the mistake, I believe, that Joseph made. He allowed himself to be in a situation where he was alone with Potiphar's wife. And this had been going on for some time. He already knew what she was trying to do. He's doing it now. He's doing his job, and he's you know he's obviously just trying to do what's right. He's trying to just perform his job and do what he needs to do. But no one else was around. And this is when she seizes the opportunity, verse twelve. And she caught him by his garment, saying, "Lie with me." And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. So she grabs him. She's like, "Lie with me." And he's just, he flees. You know, the Bible says, "Flee fornication." He fled. But he did what was right. He's, I'm not having anything to do with this. I'm getting out of here. And she's like hanging on his coat and he's just like letting her, you know, rip his coat off as, as he's running away. Yes, it's the right thing for him to do. But why, how did he even get in this mess to begin with? Because there's no witnesses. There's nobody else around. Nobody at all to say different. Because now she says, huh. She's got his garment in her hand. How did she get that? It says in verse 13, And it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth. Then she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought it in Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. So that's a story she makes up. So she sees he's already gone, and then she screams out, Help, help, you rape, rape! And she's got that piece of clothing. Joseph has no, no way, because it's, look, are you going to believe the slave? Or are you going to believe your wife when Potiphar comes home? And think about this. Even if, even if he believed Joseph, what are the, what's the consequence of that? Is he now all of a sudden going to start thinking that his wife is an adulteress? And that everyone else is going gonna, is gonna to know that his wife is an adulteress that's trying to, you know, he can't, he can't make that choice. He has to stay, you know, stay with his wife and be like, because the alternative would be terrible for him to even consider that maybe Joseph's telling the truth. But he got in a situation 
where now it's just his word against hers. And this is why, for one, this is why when we go out soul winning, you know, I oftentimes will go out soul winning by myself. I will never, you know, when I'm invited, sometimes people invite you into their house. If it's just a, a lady at the door and there's like nobody else home, it's like there's not like her family is all there or anything like that. If there's just a lady at the door and I don't care what they look like, I don't care how old they are, I do not step foot into that house. I don't do it because there's no accountability there. Because all it takes then is for her to take our invitation. This man came into my house and raped me. And what am I going to say? Hey, look, I was serving God. I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. That's all it takes is for the adulteress to even, you know, to do that. We always make sure we have someone else there to, to be with us, to be accountable. So we, when we go in pairs, that's what we do. And if someone invites us in, you know, it's not necessarily a problem going into someone's house, but I make sure there's someone else there. Say, hey, we got two or three witnesses. Then every word can be established here. That there's, there's nothing funny going on. So, and, and also, maybe she doesn't try to do that, but then someone else says, hey, there's Pastor Burson. Say, oh, hey, what's he doing going into that single woman's house? all by himself. You know, people start talking and ruin your testimony that way. Start spreading rumors. I mean, hey, it may be false, but the damage is done. I mean, think about this. When you get accused of something, you get accused of rape, you ought, no, whether you do it or not, automatically people, there's going to be tons of people out there that's be like, yep, he did it. Because they're not going to think that there's this evil woman out there who just wants to just, just call rape. Right? I mean, people are just going to be, you're going to be labeled already. People label, you know, these, these charges come against people of, uh, you know, especially like, you know, whether it be like child pornography or something like that, you know, automatically people are just, just thinking like, wow, what a pervert, what a sicko, without even knowing. And your reputation gets tarnished then forever. So we want to make sure that we're diligent to make sure as much as it's humanly possible that that doesn't happen. And I'll tell you this, when you're on the job, if you have a job that, that you have to be confined with like, someone of the opposite gender and you're married and, and you just have to spend tons of time alone with this person, I would find another job. I would. I don't think that's, you say, yeah, but I mean, there's nothing wrong. Look, all, it's over time. She was trying to break him down over time. Over time, you spend a lot of time together with someone of the opposite gender, you're going to be, you know, you could form a bond or a relationship that you ought not to be forming because that's a bond that only belongs between you and your wife. You don't want to start having, you know, this happens all the time. We have such high divorce rates in this country. Why? One, it's because women are in the workforce. They're not staying at home anymore. They're in the job. Now you have men and women working together. They're spending eight hours a day together, sometimes more. More time than they're even spending at home with their spouse. Their spouse goes off, their wife goes off, and they're working with men. The man goes off, and he's working with women. Then they finally come home. They're doing other work, and then they, and then they have a couple hours together go to bed, wake up, and they go back and do the th same thing. And they're spending more time with these other people and, and talking to them more and having conversations with them more. And they're losing the bond they have with their spouse because they're off working with somebody else. I mean, I think about these, even you know, like a police officer, they could be stuck on patrol with, like, with a woman or a man, you know, and they're just off in this car together, you know, maybe at night, just, just prowling the streets or doing whatever patrol work they're doing. What do you do? You're going to talk to someone. Pretty soon they're going to be talking about their lives and, and their children and their spouses and they're going to get to know one each other and, and, and start to develop this type of a relationship and then as soon as something might, as soon as you go through one of those low points in your marriage, because look, I'll tell you right now, and if you're newly married, you, know, you just have to understand this, it's not always your marriage. If, you know, if this is the, the peak and this is the valley, your marriage doesn't stay up here just all the time. It, that's impossible. It doesn't happen. And, and that's fine. That's why when you make your vows, for better or for worse. Because the worst times come. And that you're making that promise saying, hey, you know what? When the bad times come, because they're great right now. We're getting married. We love each other. Hey, I do. Yes, I want to spend the rest of my life with you. This is great. We're so excited. But the bad times are going to come. But you know when those bad times come? We're still going to stay together. I'm still going to remain faithful unto you. But when those bad times come is when it gets trying. And when those bad times come, the worst thing you can do is have someone of the opposite gender to be able to run off to and, and to open up your heart and tell them, oh, my husband's being so, so mean to me lately and he's not talking to me and we're not having this relationship. And then the guy on the other end is going, 
yeah, you know, my, I could feel for you. My wife hasn't been paying any attention to me either. And boom, adultery. And it happens a lot. I mean, don't tell me that I'm nuts. This is happening all the time. And you think I'm so barbaric and I'm so, you know, old-fashioned. Oh, I can't believe that you think the woman should stay at home. Yes! It causes, it introduces so many more problems. If we could just follow God's plan for our life, things would be so much better. He knows what he's talking about. God's word, no, I mean, it's truth. It's instruction. It's righteousness. He'll prosper our ways if we could just do things the way that he told, him to do, told us to do them. The husband, the head of the house, the husband, the provide for the family, the, the wife, the keeper at home, the wife raising the children, the wife doing these things. Look, God's plan is perfect. It's without flaw. But then we, you know, other people come in and, and try to mess it up and say, no, no, no. You know, men and, e men and women are, are equal and they should be doing the same exact jobs and the same roles. And it's nonsense. It's nonsense. Last point I want to make. We're close. So at the end of the chapter here in Genesis 39, we see Joseph gets thrown into prison. Right, because of these accusations that come against him. And Potiphar, I mean, he's, he's the, um, the captain of the guard. Right, so he's got, he's got kind of like this military background. He's, he's this person in charge. So he's just automatically just tosses him in prison. He's got, the, he's got the authority to do this. There's no trial or anything like that. He's just saying, okay, well, we're just going to throw you in the dungeon. In the king's prison. Not the common prison. He's in the king's prison. So he gets thrown into prison. But... It says in verse 21, but after all this stuff, after all these bad things happen, but the Lord was with Joseph. And you take comfort in that. Look, all these things happen, you know, it's not my fault, I didn't do this. And honestly, was it Joseph's fault? No. But could he have done things to pre prevent it? I think so. I think so. I don't know all the natures of his duty. I don't know if he knew that she was there, you know. But when this type of thing is happening, and if this starts happening, you better make sure that you could be as accountable as possible, make sure there's people around you at all times. He seemed to be in a position where he probably could have had somebody with him all the time. I'm guessing. I don't know that. I can't you know, say that for a fact. But if he's over everything, he probably could have made sure that somebody was assisting him in everything that he did. It's just to make sure that this wouldn't happen. Now, obviously, he wasn't thinking this was going to happen to this extreme. But had he done that, it probably could have worked out different. And we just need to make sure that we're doing things like that. But God, through all this stuff, look, God's with him. The Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. And gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. In all things, we see when, when he, he's still doing what's right in God's eyes, well, God's making him to prosper. Um, turn, I'll, I'll read from you from Romans 8.28. It's a very popular verse. I'm going to close with this. Romans 8.28 reads, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. A lot of people will quote this and say, See, all things work together for good. All things work together for good. And they're alluding to this verse. But... It's not just a blanket statement just like, well, because you come to church, all things work together for good. Or because you're saved, all things work together for good. No, the Bible says all things work together for good to them that love God. And, and um, Jesus Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So when you're doing what's right in God's eyes, when you love God by keeping his commandments, then, yeah, all things will work together for good. It doesn't mean all things will be good in and of themselves, but they'll work together for good. Was it good that Joseph got thrown in prison? No. I mean, it's, it's a horror. It's a bad thing that happened. But all things were working together. And as you see the progression of Joseph's life here in all these situations, it worked together for ultimately for good. All the bad events that happened, all these people that, that have attacked Joseph, God made sure it worked together for good because Joseph loved God, because Joseph was keeping God's commands, because Joseph was working as unto the Lord, and God was causing him to prosper. 
it says, uh, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? If you're doing what's right in God's eyes, if you're meditating in his word, if you're following the commandments, God is for you. I'll tell you that right now. God is for you. And if God be for us, who can be against us? It doesn't matter if it's Potiphar, the captain of the guard. It doesn't matter the, you know, who is against you. Because who can be against you? If God is for you, hey, God, you know, this man could throw you into prison. But if God be for you, who could be against you? God is making sure that everything happened that the way it was supposed to happen. And, or at least the way that it would turn out for the good. Well, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this story. God, I pray that you would please help us to let these words sink into our hearts. God, that, that we would be um, not ignorant of the devices of the adulteress as men, especially, dear Lord, the, the adulteress that flatters with her lips and that will try to put us up on a pedestal and that is hunting for the precious life, dear Lord. Help us to be wise and to not fall into that trap and not give in to the lusts of our flesh, dear Lord, but that we would take every single precaution to avoid that trap because we will be brought to nothing and our lives will literally be destroyed if we go down that path, dear God. Help us to be just completely aware of that great truth in that the, the, the flipping of the eyelids, as it were, is just an illusion. It's a mirage. The beauty, the outward beauty, when her, her inward is like a wolf, dear Lord, looking to devour the precious life. It's just, it's fake. And the amount of pleasure you think you might get is, is not worth, it's not worth one bit of it. And um, Lord, just, just help every man, every Christian man to know this and to, to be able to um, steer clear of the adulterous woman. And God, I pray that you please help us to be um, proper obedient servants for those of us who are, who are bond or those of us who are, who are um, working for other people or in positions of um, where we're supposed to be in obedience. Dear Lord, help us to work as if we're working towards you and that you would give us the right heart and mindset, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.